I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 14, and we're continuing our study of preferential matters. We're learning to prefer one another in those things that are matters of indifference, those gray areas. And perhaps over the last few weeks, you've been working out some of those gray areas in your life. Maybe you've been making a list of 20 or 30 or 50 or so items and working out which ones of these can I do and which ones of these can I not do. Maybe you've figured out where you stand on all of your gray areas. I want you to know that that is not enough. To work all those things out is not enough. The passage confronting us this morning is all about influence. It is all about the consideration of the effect of my choices in gray areas on the spiritual vitality of Christians around me. The Apostle Paul has been dealing with the weak and the strong in respect to preferential areas. Those who have knowledge and those who do not. Those who with a free conscience can participate in some things while others are not able to. And here this morning he turns the corner and really points this text at the strong, those who feel a freedom in certain areas, those who feel in matters of indifference that they have a liberty in Christ. And so let's listen together as we read our text, Romans 14, verses 13 to 18. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. What we're going to find in this passage from the Apostle Paul are five principles to govern our use of Christian liberties. Paul is taking aim at the strong and begins to put on the strong the burden of responsibility for all others. And he provides five principles to govern the use of Christian liberties. And these principles, these five principles we'll look at this morning, must become forged as convictions in our hearts. My hope and my prayer is after today we might be able to resonate with the principles in this text at the conviction level. They ought to be able to roll off our tongues and rattle around in our hearts as we make decisions in areas of preference, in areas of gray. It begins with the first principle in verse 13. You must begin with serious determination. When we're to think about how we exercise Christian liberties in the body of Christ, it begins with a serious determination. Look what Paul says. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. The therefore in verse 13 really is a a summary of what has gone before in verses 10 to 12. And do you remember that from last week? There is to be a final adjudication by the Lord Jesus Christ for every individual Christian for deeds done in the body. And so we are not to assess one another's motives, those things we cannot see at the heart level, as we participate in areas of preference, areas of indifference. You do not see what the Lord sees. You and I cannot see at the heart level whether a brother is doing one activity for the Lord, for his glory as worship. And so we are to leave those things for that final adjudication. But in verse 13, Paul turns a corner. Notice the second half. But rather determine this. And determine here is the same word he uses in the first half of the verse, verse 13, as judge. 
Paul is using a play on words here. Don't judge each other in areas of difference, but do judge yourself. You can't see the heart of your brother. He may be pleasing the Lord in the activity that you don't participate in. Your job is not to analyze his worship level participation, but you are to analyze you. And there are several striking features in the original here. There's a conjunction that indicates a very strong contrast. There is a change from us to you, and there is a change in verb tense. All of this gives us this feel. Let's don't judge each other, but you judge you. And what are you to judge? What serious determination are you to make? You and I are to make this very serious and sober determination, not about our brother's activity, but about our own. Not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. And an obstacle originally was a, uh, something that causes a misstep or causes loose footing, causes someone to stumble or trip. A stumbling block literally was a device used to catch something alive. It's the word for a trap. It came to be a metaphor for some action or circumstance that leads one to act contrary to a proper course of action or his set of beliefs. It is a temptation, an enticement. In English, uh, we get our word scandal from this second word. And the prohibition here is... Don't put a trip or a trap in front of your brother by your use of Christian liberties. Don't do it. You and I, in making this very serious and sober determination, must pursue Christian liberties not casually, flippantly, thoughtlessly, but with a personal conviction about what is allowable based on what my careless use of a liberty will do for a brother in the Lord. Do not put a trip or a trap in front of him. And the burden in this passage is on the strong, on those who believe they have freedom in a gray area. And Christian, your freedoms are not left to be, ly- are not to be left lying around to trip up other believers. You must make a serious determination to judge yourself in this matter. Are you exercising your freedoms in Christ in such a way that poses a spiritual danger to other Christians? And not only must you make a serious determination to assess your own activities and their impact on others, but secondly, you must be convinced by a settled realization. The second governing principle that must regulate your use of Christian liberties is that you be convinced Convinced by a settled realization. Look at verse 14. Paul says, I know and I am convinced in the Lord Jesus. Three ways, back to back to back, Paul affirms something that he is absolutely confident about. And what is Paul confident about? All meat is on the menu. He's sure of that. He's persuaded, he's convinced He is acting in faith, and he says all of this in the Lord Jesus, whether by direct revelation from the Lord Jesus in Paul's personal seminary training from Christ, or whether from the Lord Jesus' own words in the Gospel of Mark where he declared all foods to be clean. Whatever way Paul is referring to here, he has the full authority of Jesus Christ behind him in his conviction that he can eat anything. Now, this statement is parenthetical. It comes in between verse 13 and verse 15. Verse 13 makes a a prohibition, and then verse 15 is going to give a reason. But right in the middle of that, as a parenthesis, Paul wants to let us know that he sides with the strong on eating foods, foods that were unclean under Mosaic law, or even meat that had been sold in support of the idolatry industry. And notice how he says it, I know and I am convinced. This very serious phrase shows up elsewhere in Paul's writings and indicates a strong conviction. Paul affirms that his knowledge about food is in accord with Jesus' mind on it. He's convinced. So he eats in faith. He eats as worship. He eats with thankfulness. 
his is a settled realization that bacon is on the menu. And look what he says. Nothing is unclean in itself. Unclean is simply the word common, but in context of ceremonial observance, its opposite is holy. There were things that were common and there were things that were set apart. There were unclean foods and there were clean foods under Mosaic law. You could eat lamb but not pig. Tilapia was clean and crab legs were unclean. But for this new era, when Jew and Gentile would be together in one new man in the church, Jesus had declared all foods clean. And if Paul, the Jew, the Jew born anew, wanted to eat a pork chop or a lobster, he could do so in good faith before Christ. And if a cow was killed in the temple for the worship of an idol and the meat was sold at the market, Paul knew he could have a steak and he could please the Lord in doing so. If Paul was invited to a Gentile home where vegetable shish kebabs were prepared in an unkosher kitchen, Paul knew he could eat freely, thankfully, worshipfully before God. Yet notice the last half of verse 14. In the original, it reads, Nothing is unclean except... New American Standard says, Nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. There's one exception. There's one food item not on the menu. What is it? Anything that you think is not on the menu? To him who thinks anything to be unclean, it is unclean. This principle is affirmed later in this text when Paul says, if not done in faith, it is sin. In other words, if you're participating in what you think is a Christian freedom, but you are not fully convinced in the Lord Jesus that it is a freedom, then it is a sin. And you have to recognize that not just for yourself, but for those around you in the body of Christ. How do you go about being fully convinced about a gray area or an area of preference? Well, you have to start with this conviction. Don't sin. Right? I think we get confused about this a little bit sometimes when we think about universal depravity and total depravity. Universal depravity means everybody sins. Total depravity means every part of the human constitution is tainted by sin. And we think, well, if it's that bad, then why do we make a big deal out of sin? If everybody does it and, and if every part of you is tainted with it, then, I mean, come on. Can't we loosen up a little bit? And we've lost sight of what sin is before a holy God. You and I must maintain a right fear of sin. Christian, be afraid to sin. Be afraid to dishonor your God. If you step into what you think is a Christian liberty, but it might be sin, or you're not fully convinced and persuaded in the Lord Jesus Christ that it's okay, then guess what? It is sin for you. You cannot casually wade into what seems like sin, call it a gray area, and go for it. If it seems like sin to you, it is sin for you. Even if the Christian culture around you makes it look like no big deal. Start with a conviction. I don't want to sin. Next, move to this. Know your Bible. Know your Bible. If you're concerned about a gray area or a liberty or you're confused by what other Christians seem to be doing, open up your Bible. Get Jesus' mind on the issue. Understand it from God's perspective. Look at everything the Bible has to say about it, directly or in principle. What principles apply? Ask other Christians. Maybe you haven't thought all the way, all, this all the way through. Can you help give me clarity in what God's word might say about this? Investigate. Know the mind of Christ on food if you're a first century Jew trying to sort this out. Do you remember Peter? It took him three times to accept pork chops into his heart. <laughs> right, the dream and the, and, and the white sheet with all the food. I've never eaten anything unclean. Right? And obviously a lot was going on there. There was a transition period where table fellowship with Gentiles was, was going to be okay. Look, Peter had a hang-up on that for a long time. And we should understand that a Jew in the first century who had been taught all his life clean and unclean categories of food 
when Jesus came and declared all foods clean, that was not going to be an easy sell. And what a Jewish Christian in the first century could not do was just say, well, I guess everybody's eating pork chops, I'm going to. No, he needed to educate himself. He needed to thoroughly get Christ's mind on it so that he could say with Paul, I am convinced and fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus that this pork chop is okay. He needed to do that. I had a youth leader in my early high school years who went on a Mexico mission trip. And a bunch of kids in Mexico were diving off of a bridge into a river. And one kid after another diving head first and coming back up. And so uh, my youth leader assumed that, well, it's, it's okay to jump in. He dove in, hit the bottom, and then stood up in water that didn't come up to his waist. And he realized the, these kids who had been doing this all their lives had perfected the art of shallow recovery. They weren't hitting the bottom. You know the old adage, investigate and then dive. Find out how deep the water is. There is real danger for Christians diving into gray areas without informed biblical knowledge on the issues. You've got to build into your life the conviction that whatever you do, you are to do all as worship. And to do that, you must be fully convinced that your freedom honors the Lord. And Paul had this knowledge. The knowledge by itself is not enough. This knowledge had to be handled appropriately. Right? It's not enough for Paul to just know he can eat pork chops and then go on with his life. That knowledge has to be handled gently, unselfishly, humbly. And this leads to the third principle that must govern our use of Christian liberties. We begin with a serious determination not to trip up my brother, and we must be convinced by a settled realization that everything I do, I do in faith. And thirdly, you must operate with loving consideration. Operate with loving consideration. Verse 15. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. It's good for us to start with the question, what am I allowed to do? Now, that's an okay question. And to get biblically informed about what is permissible and what is not in the Christian life. But that doesn't go far enough. We must ask the question further, how do I love my brother? How can I love my brother? The strong brother is not wrong about food, but it is not enough to be persuaded that all food is okay to eat before the Lord. I must love those around me, and so I must build into my own life a conviction that I will do no injury to a brother by my freedom. Look at verse 4. 15, the four there, the first word, really connects us back to the end of verse 13. Do not put a stumbling block in a brother's way, for if you hurt your brother, you're not walking in love. Your freedoms can hurt others, so use the freedoms in a way that is governed by loving consideration, thinking about other people. And the word hurt here is to be deeply grieved. Some of your English translations may use the word grieved. By the way, to, to be grieved here, the, the weaker brother, this is not somebody who's just upset that you're doing things he doesn't want to do, and he wants to impose his control over you. So, hey, I'm grieved that you had pork chops, therefore you can't eat them because I'm grieved about it. That's not the place of the weaker brother, uh, seeking to impose his own selfish ideals onto everybody else. No, the, the weaker brother here, this grief here, uh, will lead us down to something much more severe than that. And we see that in the near context where Paul says, you will destroy your brother, verse 15. The grief here is a deep sorrow. That is, the, the dear brother brought to sorrow because of his lack of confidence about a gray area and because of your careless use of freedom in that area. It would be sin for him to indulge in what you're doing, and he sees you indulging without any apparent pang of guilt. It might be something like in the first century, 
someone who, before they knew Christ, was a practicing idolater. He regularly went to the temple, and he regularly worshipped the pantheon of deities. Uh, he would give up a, a little bit of his money, and he would give up a little bit of his time to try to appease a, a regional or pagan deity in order to get something back. It's, you know, rub the lamp of the genie three times and say the magic words, the genie comes out and says, tell me your three wishes. This was idolatry. It essentially was the worship of self, but you had to pay the price of paying the piper, paying the idol. It often involved sensuality and immorality as part of pagan idolatrous practices. And it involved sacrificing animals. And the meat of those sacrificed animals was sold at the local fries and the bashes out the back door of the temple. And so a Christian in the first century who had grown up as an idolater spent all of his life associating a ribeye steak with the worship of a demon. All of a sudden, at the next church picnic, you're eating a ribeye steak and there's juice running down your beard and, and he knows that, uh, where, where those steaks come from. And he's troubled. He's grieved. I grew up with that. How could a Christian ever do that? <laughs> now, he needs to be informed that an idol is nothing and the meat itself is not tainted just because sinners were around it had other purposes for it than the glory of God. But he's hurt, and he's troubled in his conscience. And if he eats in that hurt and in that trouble because you were reckless, there is a consequence. Look at the prohibition in verse 15. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. You see, for him to run over his own conscience and partake in what you have freedom of, given the state of his own heart, is to bring ruin in his spiritual life. To destroy here is to bring upon ruin, that is spiritual ruin. And, and, and how does this happen? Listen, if he follows your example without your knowledge, he will violate his conscience in imitating you. As Matthew Henry has said, the beginning of sin is like the letting out of a water. We're not sure that that water will stop anywhere on this side of eternal destruction. Violating your conscience in any matter is a pathway to apostasy. A falling away from God altogether, a walking away from a profession of Christ. And this is what sin tends toward. Sin is pointing 180 degrees away from Jesus Christ. It is pointing the other direction from the glory of God and from obedience to Him. And anytime you take up sin, you are running away from heaven. And the Bible over and over and over again gives warnings about apostasy. And it gives these warnings to Christians, to professing believers. Why? Is it because the elect are somehow in danger of losing their salvation? No. In fact, the warnings are one of God's means to keep God's people in the faith. But listen to this reality. Faith unsustained is apostasy. Can a genuine Christian ever be brought to ultimate spiritual ruin? No. But professing Christians are every day. Charles Hodge said, believers are constantly spoken of as in danger of perdition. They are saved only if they continue steadfast unto the end. If they apostatize, they perish. Saints are preserved, not despite apostasy, but saints are preserved from apostasy. And warnings like this are one of God's means at preserving his people. And Christians obeying this principle related to stronger and weaker brothers in freedom areas is one of those ways we are our brother's keeper. We watch after each other. 
We're concerned about each other's spiritual vitality, and we're eager to protect from spiritual ruin. You're not acting in love if you won't abstain to avoid hurting your brother. Have you ever done it? Have you ever curbed your own freedoms for the benefit of someone in your life? Jerry Raggis said, if you have never given up, a, given up a preference that might cause a brother to trip up, if you have never given one up, then how can you be sure it is a Christian freedom? That's really helpful. You know, moms do this constantly for their children. Give up freedoms. Give up things they could do, would want to do, would certainly have the freedom to do for the benefit of a little one who is absolutely dependent upon them and maybe wouldn't understand mom freedom stuff. God has programmed in the DNA of mothers to do this instinctively. Have you learned this instinct as a Christian in the church? To just think, oh, my choices, my activities, my liberties, I'm free in Christ to do this, and what effect will that have on my brothers, on my sisters in Christ? And notice how verse 15 concludes, do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Right, this raises the stakes a little bit. It was a high price to love that brother. What did Jesus the Christ do in order to love your brother in the Lord? Took on flesh, came to earth, went to the cross, suffered under his father's anger, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God the Father crushed the Son in order to justify the many. In order to pay for the sins of everyone who would ever believe in him, past, present, and future, Jesus Christ became the sin bearer for them all. He didn't bear his own sins on the cross. He bore yours, Christian. And he bore your brother's sins. It was a high cost for love, a high price to pay for love, and God's perfect love for the unlovable in the gospel. Listen, it's a low cost for you to love, it's a low cost. Set some freedom aside in order to preserve the spiritual life of my brother. Jesus Christ emptied himself, gave up his life for your brother. You can give up a pork chop. That's the message. One old commentator, I don't know if he was old when he wrote it. He's been with the Lord a long time. He's an old guy. Said, do not think more of your food than Christ thought of his life. Luther, paraphrasing 1 Corinthians 13 on love, says, If I have faith so as to eat all foods, but have not love, I am nothing. It's not enough to know what's permissible for you to do as a Christian, what is okay by God. You must also ask, what serves my brothers and sisters in the Lord? And we've got to forge these convictions. We begin with a serious determination to not trip up our brother. We move to being convinced by a settled realization that what I do, I do by faith and as worship, a godwardness in all of my choices and activities. Thirdly, we operate with loving consideration of our brothers and sisters. And a fourth principle to govern your use of Christian freedom is you must maintain an eternal valuation. You must maintain an eternal valuation. Look what Paul says in verses 16 and 17. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, here gives a 
summary inference of what has gone before. If you are to value your brother then you must value what is eternally valuable over and against what is temporally permissible. And he says, literally, don't let your good be slandered. Uh, The word there is blasphemed. What is good be spoken evil about. Bacon is objectively good. It is. It's just good. Don't let it be slandered. Don't let bacon be blasphemed. Don't let it be spoken evil of. Don't give bacon a bad rap. Don't give it a bad name by destroying your brother with it. Right? A really good tool used as a murderous weapon then becomes, oh, so ugly, awful. There's an explanation in verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the kingdom of God? Is the kingdom that belongs to God? It is His kingdom. And in the Apostle Paul, this phrase, kingdom of God, shows up less than a dozen times. It is almost entirely eschatological. That means it is the coming kingdom. It is the kingdom which belongs to God and will one day come to the earth. This is in keeping with what Jesus taught about the kingdom. When Jesus, the king, was on the earth, he said, the kingdom is at hand. And then when he left, he told his disciples, pray that it will come back. Remember that prayer? Thy kingdom come. And the kingdom over which Jesus is the king will come to the earth. And it is characterized not by some things, but by some other things. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Wait, didn't Jesus in the upper room discourse say, I will not drink this with you until we drink it again in the kingdom? There is going to be drinking in the kingdom. Isaiah 25 makes it clear there will be eating in the kingdom, the choicest meats and the finest wines. This statement is not saying there's no eating or drinking in the kingdom. He's saying that's not what the kingdom's about. That's not what what it consists of, these temporal externals that everybody's hung up about in gray areas. We are kingdom citizens now. That is, we are citizens of a kingdom that is away but is coming here. And so we live by the priorities of that coming kingdom. We order our lives under the values of that coming kingdom. We belong to the king. We represent the king. And like an ambassador from a faraway land, we are citizens of that land while we carry on here. We carry on the culture of that land, the language of that land, the values of that land, wherever we go here. We truly are strangers here, even though here is the only place we've ever been. The kingdom to which we belong is not about mere externals, not about eating and drinking. It means that our priorities transcend eating and drinking. And by principle, they transcend all these gray areas, these matters of a difference that we sometimes elevate to such high levels with one another. Listen, this world has eating and drinking. In fact, Eating and drinking are the priorities. Live to work, work to live, work to eat, eat to live, live to eat. (laughs) Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we'll die. What else is there? This world only has temporal things. And Christian, your life is not about that. The Lord knows what you need. He knows before you ask. He gives graciously. 1 Timothy 6, he gives us all things to enjoy. These things are true. We do eat, we do drink, but we do all for the glory of God, and we don't do it as if eating and drinking are everything. Do we have freedom to eat meat from the entire menu during our short stay here on the earth? Sure, enjoy it. For the glory of God, but not at the expense of things that last forever. What are those priorities of our coming kingdom here in this text? Righteousness, peace, joy. Righteousness, peace, and joy that we have with God in a vertical relationship. 
We have been given righteousness as a gift. We therefore, Romans 5.1, have peace with God and we rejoice. But these transcendent realities become our flavor as Christians and they leak out into our horizontal relationships as well. They ought to characterize us in all of our relationships with each other in the church. These are in fact fruits or fruit of the Holy Spirit, which he produces in us. Practical, lived out righteousness, peace with one another, and joy in and with each other. Listen to James 3.16. James says, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. You see, nothing breeds contention in the church like elevated preferences. I really like some particular element of my freedom in Christ, or I don't like some particular element of your freedom in Christ, and so I'm going to elevate my preference to the level of conviction and judgmentalism and make you fit into my grid because it's all about me. And listen, a bunch of me monsters in the same room can only produce strife, discord, jealousy, and every evil thing. And so you and I are to pursue the things that characterize God's coming kingdom. These are the things that last forever. While Christian freedoms in different matters, they'll all go away. Bacon's great, but it does not rise to the level of kingdom of God stuff. From an eternal perspective, your exercise of your Christian freedom just doesn't amount to much. So how does a good thing come to be slandered? When does what is good for you turn into something evil? Well, when a good thing trips up a fellow Christian, now that good thing has a bad reputation. Or when a good thing is elevated to kingdom of God status, when bacon becomes my identity... When it becomes the thing I just will not let go of. You can have my bacon when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers, right? And I will defend that over and against everything else in my brother's lives. When bacon becomes more important to me than righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. A good thing becomes evil when any freedom becomes so important for me that I won't give it up for the sake of a brother. Again, if you won't give it up, doesn't that mean you're actually enslaved to it? There's no sin in abstaining. But you may very well sin by imbibing. If you relinquish a freedom, you have not lost one smidgen of eternal value. But if you injure a brother, you are sacrificing things of everlasting import. And we have missed the whole point of the Christian life when we boil it down to the question, what can I do and what can I not do? Do you understand? That's just not the Christian life. The legalist stresses, here's what you can't do. And the libertine says, here's what you can do. And both of them have missed Christ. Christianity is not made up of the externals. Let's see, external only religion is way easier than following Christ. It is the religion of natural man. It's what man comes up with. It's what man can do, pull himself up by his own bootstraps and just give me a list of things I can and can't do and I'll try my best. But to surrender your life at the level of heart motives, of the invisible you before the Lord Jesus Christ, that requires supernatural power. That requires a new you. It requires a transformation, new birth, birth from above. But that is the Christian life. And that brings us to the final governing principle this morning. You must be driven by a double motivation. You must be driven by a double motivation in your exercise of Christian liberties. Verse 18. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. The subject of the sentence is the one serving Christ in this way. The one serving Christ in this way. Uh, the verb there is slaving to Christ. Do you see yourself as Christ's slave? That's a Christian. 
And in this way, in what way is Paul talking about? That is, in valuing eternal things enough to give up temporal preferences for the eternal benefit of blood-bought brothers. You serve Christ in that way, and you get a double benefit. This ought to be your double motivation. Acceptable to God, pleasing to men. Pleasing to God, acceptable to men. Approved by men. The, the first of these motivations is just being pleasing to God. The word could be translated acceptable to him. That is doing what makes him happy. Doing what accords with his will. It pleases God when his people obey. You want to be pleasing to God in the exercise of your Christian liberties... Do it in such a way that you value eternal things enough to give up temporal preferences for the eternal benefit of blood-bought brothers. You will be pleasing to God. The other benefit, the other motivation that ought to drive our use of Christian liberties here in this text is the approval of men. We don't mean by that fear of man in a sinful way. Uh, the word approved here is a word that means tested unto approval. It was the word used in metallurgy, the refining of gold, when it's refined by heat that brings the impurities to the top and results in a purer metal, right? It's the word for the testing of a soldier. You think about a Navy SEAL who passes all the tests. He gets through hell week and buds and all that's required to be a Navy SEAL. And you recognize that the testing itself helped produce the soldier, that's the idea here, to be esteemed and respected because they were refined by and they passed the trials of SEAL training. And to be approved by men means you have put yourself under trial, to be pleasing to God. And the motivation there is to be approved, tested and approved, even in the eyes of people. In other words, Seeking to please God in this matter and slaving to Christ means you also benefit your brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's a benefit to them. You can serve Christ by eating or by don't eating. But you can't serve Christ by destroying a brother, acting contrary to love, or acting in a way that you can just live for yourself and to yourself. I think our response to is my life just going to get squeezed when I have to think about other people all the time? Reveals that we have not been living in a Godward, worship-focused direction all along. And it just took my brother with a weakness in a certain area to reveal it in my own heart. Man, I'm living for myself. The whole life of the Christian is self-denial. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must take up his cross, deny himself daily, follow me. We are to love God from the heart. We are to love one another sincerely. These have always been the two greatest commands from God. They are the twin motivation here in verse 18. To be motivated in every choice by a desire to please God and to benefit others. Listen, that is much harder than keeping a set of rules to work out all the gray areas and make a new list of do's and don'ts. The Pharisees did that, right? They tithed mint and cumin and dill. And you think, oh, I think I've seen those in my spice rack. They're really tiny. You mean they took a one grain out of every 10 and set it aside unto the Lord? Yes. Well, that seems ridiculous. That seems really hard. Actually, it's way easier than doing what this text demands, Look, counting out a tenth grain of a tiny spice, anybody can do that. Natural man can do that. Just count them out. Get a microscope if you need to, but count them out. Just set them aside. But dealing with the heart motives on the inside, oh, that's way harder. And yet that's exactly what this text is demanding of us. That we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we love our brothers and sisters in Christ that we love one another, to value eternal things over and against temporal enjoyments, temporal so-called freedoms, or actual freedoms for the sake of one another. There's no one who did this better than the Lord Jesus Christ, no greater example of selfless, self-emptying love. 
He could have done lots of things he chose not to do in his earthly existence so that we could be forgiven, so that we could live. Lord Jesus, we do thank you. Your kindness to us is staggering. You have done all that it takes to bring us to yourself, to bring us to your Father in love. And we pray that we would mirror and echo that love in our relationships to one another. We ask it in your name. Amen.